Hello and welcome to today's Secret Learning Webinar titled, Why Product Management Matters. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Stephen Haynes. Stephen is the founder and president of Secret Learning Networks and the Product Management Executive Board. Stephen's primary objective is to help companies across industries and around the world to effectively organize for and manage the product management function. Stephen has held global product management and business leadership roles at Oracle and AT&T. Stephen's career also includes 12 years as an adjunct professor of marketing and management at Rutgers University. He's also the author of category-defying books, such as The Product Manager's Desk Reference and The Managing Product Management. His third book, The Product Manager's Survival Guide, will be available early next year. Today, Stephen will be presenting this webinar, Why Product Management Matters. Stephen, if you're ready, the floor is all yours. Welcome. I'm ready to go. Thank you so much. Welcome today. Um, there are people calling in from around the world, and I'd like to express a good morning, a good afternoon, and a good evening. Um, as Therese said, I'm uh, from Sequent Learning Networks, and there are a couple of things about our company that would be worthy of note. There are a couple of aspects of our company's mission. The first point is to help elevate the skills and capabilities of product managers and marketers. And on the other end of the spectrum is to help executives to improve the effectiveness of product management in their organization. And as you can see, we've helped thousands and thousands of people. I'm running the company I have for 10 and a half years, except I don't do this alone. It is a team effort of former corporate executives. And we, we say that we have the depth and breadth of experience to earn the credibility to guide our clients on their product management journey. As Teresa also said, I've written several books. And these are footprints, stakes in the ground for thought leadership. The product manager's desk reference sets forth the body of knowledge for product management. And the book Managing Product Management has become an indispensable resource for the senior executives to effectively organize for product management. Also, as Teresa said, uh, my third book is in progress. And one of the things that was really important to me when I started writing this book was that when, when we work with a lot of different product managers, product management people tend to start their journey at a variety of places. Some people want to be product managers and they work in a different department. Some people are product managers who just want to restart their career and kind of get a, a reset. And there are other people who move into higher level roles and very often it's really difficult to figure out where you should get started. And so one of the things I'm going to talk about in a little while is how do we actually do some of those kinds of things. There are a variety of good resources available for participants. On our website at sequentlearning.com, there are templates, newsletters. There's a public blog that we call the Product Management Exchange, as well as resources like our Product Management Lifecycle that I'll be talking to you about in a little while. There's some really important points that I'd like to bring up for the program. First is, I really want to talk about the current state of product management, and then to talk a little bit more about the role of product management in the firm, and then to portray the main players, the product managers, and the teams that they lead. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about how product managers and their teams do what they need to do inside of the organization, and what reference model they use to get their work done. And lastly, to define what we need from our executives and why, ultimately, product management matters to the company. So very recently, maybe in the last few months, I was noticing on a LinkedIn group where a person asked, what is product management? And there were hundreds and hundreds of responses. And the thing that perplexed me was the fact that there were so many differences and so many different interpretations. And if we can just lay down a foundation, and this is a very, very simple foundation, product management refers to the business management of products, nothing more. It's the business management of products. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the key structures that we have to talk about because I have to say, with such a very easy definition to understand, is there a problem? We do a lot of research, a lot of benchmarking, and here are some things that you might find interesting and you may actually resonate to. Think about this. 
that the role of product management, and look, it says capital P and a capital M, is misunderstood by leaders of other business functions. In many, many respects, in, in, in research that we do when we're interviewing executives in other functions, we'll say, can you tell us a little bit more about what product management brings to the table? Tell us a little bit about the product managers that you've worked with. And the, the main point is that there are so many different definitions and so many different interpretations. Okay? Then we have some other issues, and I'm sure many of you have seen this before, where you believe and you're working in an organization where product ought to have a, bit, a bigger and a better footprint, but we have a very deal-driven organization. Or engineering is a very, very strong function because, of course, they know more about the product than anybody. However, in other cases, product management is treated like project management or product development. And what ends up happening, and, and I have felt this as a, as, a, as a product manager and as a product head, and I'm sure many of you feel this in today's companies, that executives are pounding the table and say, give us the innovations, give us the breakthrough products, and we don't have enough time, we don't have enough resource, and our insights are rare because sometimes I'm traveling to go visit customers. Of note, number one, think about product management in various states of maturity. There are a lot of different companies, for instance, that have been doing product management really well for a very long period of time. In my book, Managing Product Management, you see companies like TD Bank and Thomas & Betts who have done a terrific job, right, because they've stabilized. There's a lot of consistency and evolution. But in a lot of other companies, that doesn't happen. And you all know this, right? The reorg is coming down the pike. We have new leaders. They will try to remake product management in their eyes. And in a very recent um, uh, engagement with a client where we had been working for several years, the chief marketing officer left the company. And all the product management performance improvement programs were put on hold. And why? Well, the executives and the other teams wanted to wait to see what that CMO's interpretation of product management ought to be instead of staying with the program. And when you have a lot of this change, you see a lot of variation. And variation means that there's a lot of inefficiency. And so you get the ebbing and flowing along with the business cycle with what product management can bring to the table. And as you look at the picture on the side of the page, there's our new head of product management. And if you can see in the little bubble above that person's head, there are a lot of different wheels in different shapes. They're trying to reinvent the wheel. And I think it's time to stop. And I'm going to talk about how. First of all, we need to understand not only that product management is the business management of products, but inside of a firm, product management ought to be chartered, all right? chartered as part of the overall corporation charter. And that means it is genetically engineered into the company, and that when senior executives commit to the holistic management of products and services across their life cycles, we have a better chance of improving corporate performance. Now, the, the picture on the side of the page is really quite interesting because it looks like the, the curve that we learned about in Marketing 101. And what, a lot ha what happens in a lot of companies is that a, they believe that this area, all right, from planning to launch, is what product management people are really involved in. That's product development. All right? And as you see here, this is negative cash flow. We look at this area of products in market. All right? And then we look at post-launch product management. This is where we make our money. And so when you're committed to product management and full-stream product lifecycle management, what you end up getting is the business management of products and portfolios across their life cycles. Now, it's really quite interesting. Um, if you look at this picture, it's my artistic rendition of a picket fence and I use this picture in the uh, Managing Product Management book. It's really quite interesting. But if you take any of the business functions, marketing, sales, operations, development, supply chain, or customer service, and you try to stand them up on their own, you know what happens? They don't have a back brace. They fall down. And you're all really familiar with the expression functional silo. Those are functional silos. Product management can't be a functional silo. Product management is a horizontal integrating function. They synchronize the work of other people on behalf of the company and behalf of the product's business. So we are the best people and the best function to bring this about. No other function thinks in an integrative fashion the way product management people think. So who are the main players? Hmm. Let's talk about the main players, the product manager. 
Now, if we look at this definition, this is a definition we use in our workshops and in all of the material I've written about, and I'm sure this is probably not unusual to, to see this, but a person appointed to be a proactive product or product line mini business owner and a leader of a cross-functional team. Now, I monitor a lot of blogs and a lot of media, and over the last couple of years, I've noticed a lot of debate about this expression. The, the product manager is the CEO or the general manager of the product. The product manager is not a CEO. What the product manager is is a person who thinks like a CEO, like an integrating business generalist. Now, in many, many years of my experience, um, it took me a long time to get to that place to be able to at least earn the credibility and earn empowerment to be able to stimulate a team's mission to optimize the product's market performance and financial performance. Now, there's an issue, all right? So the issue is I can appoint this person to be this, this mini business owner or to think like a CEO, all right? But that's really difficult. And I want to go back to functional silos and functional paradigms. I'm a finance guy. In my company, is, is all of our subject matter experts came from someplace else. We have a physicist, we have a chemical engineer, we have mathematicians, uh, we have uh, electrical engineers, all kinds of people who came into product management and thrived as product leaders. Now, if people come from all of those different functions and they bring their knowledge and their skills and their paradigms with them, and they try to be a product person based on a functional paradigm, they will inevitably fail. And what ends up happening is you get a lot of problems. You get the, all the stuff you see in the, uh, in the box on the right side of the page, the process confusion, underperforming po products, a lack of market focus, not as much innovation, bad decisions. Those are the kinds of things that result from a lack of integrative thinking. So product managers need to think like business people, which is why product management is the business management of product. And if product managers are supposed to play such a great leadership role, and they're all different, what can we do about it? Well, we have to understand how we learn our jobs. And, it, and I have an expression. And the expression is, you can't make an appointment with experience. And when a new product manager checks into their job, all right, or a new product leader checks into their job, they are very reactive. They're reactive to the emails that are coming in and the, the meetings that they have to go to. And, and their work gets done in a very, very haphazard way, like a mind map. And so we have to literally create connections over time. And that can add a lot of time to our own de per personal development. So what we have to do is figure out how we can better assimilate to produce better business outcomes. So let's start at the top. We take our mind map. We know that we're going to acquire knowledge, skills, and experience from a variety of places, and we're going to knit it together. But what we have to do is assimilate. We have to facilitate. We have to integrate. We have to synthesize. And these are the kinds of things that let us be able to better strategize, to better prioritize, to lead our teams to make better decisions, to communicate up and down and across the organization, and then ultimately to be able to lead. So we, we bring all, all of these mind map elements, we link them together, and we cement them with good documents that are consistently used. And we see a lot of document confusion in, in companies where the business case is a substitute for the strategy and the product roadmap is a substitute for the strategy and the launch plan is a substitute for the business case. Each document has a purpose. So if we assimilate properly and use the documents properly, guess what we produce? better products, more profitable products, and happier customers and greater market share. That's what our job is. So let's take a break for a second. What do you think, and this is a poll, so you enter it in on your screen, what do you think the single most important attribute that executives look for in a product manager? And I'll give you a, about you know, 10 or 15 seconds to look at this. And you can look, technical background, domain experience, business acumen, getting stuff done in a complex organization, product management, project management expertise. And I'm quite surprised looking at the, get the um, ah, no, I lied, I'm, I'm not on the right level, getting things done in a complex organization and business acumen. This is the race for the finish, all right? Let's go see, because I see now that we're, we're going. And do you want to know something? You're about there. Product executives and business executives want product managers to have a, a good level of business acumen. They want to know how the business works, and this works for two ways. Number one, how your business works is great, 
Number two, how do your competitors' business work? All right, because you want to compare yours with others. And you know something in the B the in the B to B world, which is the place where we play with the most. All right, how does your customers' customers work? All right, customer businesses, competitive businesses, all have to look. You have to kind of look at them collectively and see where do I fit in the marketplace. Then we have to get our work done. And getting work done in the complex organization is no small task. It's politicking. It's influencing. It's that shared sense of purpose that drives team members towards solid objectives. And when you can build a, a shared sense of purpose, you break down those functional boundaries and those picket fences will stand up straight because you're the guys who are going to be leading it. And because you are, because you have the passion and the determination and that, the, the sensitivity, the market nuance to help solve problems, it will be an amazing, amazing feat to see how product management can really, really effectively take root in a, firm, in a firm. And you want to know what else? You have to take good notes. If you ever notice what happens in states and counties and municipalities, what you'll notice is every few years there's an election. And when the, when the count, council committee people get reelected or thrown out of office, the new people come in and on a lot of promises, they have to come in and say, what did we commit to in the past? And if you ever walk into a town hall and you see the highway department and the tax department and the building department, their work didn't stop. They live on a master plan. So if you're a product person, you come into your role, and you don't have a plan of record to refer back to, there's a lot of real reinventing that's going on. And so we need a master plan as our source of documentation, our single source of truth, the ongoing plan of record for a product or a product line. And this is a way that a product manager can earn leadership. Because if you're the one who's keeping the books, right, and you're keeping the records and the artifacts, and you're exposing this team to continuous improvement, guess what happens? You earn more credibility. So we can't do it by ourselves. We've learned that a long time ago because we don't want to do the work because we have a lot of integrating and synchronizing work. It's not that we don't roll up our sleeves, but sometimes we get stuck doing a lot of other work. Maybe we shouldn't have to. Maybe we should leverage our cross-functional product team. Now, this is a very, very um, typical model. It's a hub-and-spoke model, but it really is a true representation of a cross-functional product team. And you know most of the major players on it. You can take your industry and you can substitute it, but the product manager is the hub. They are the leader of the team. Now, there are a lot of conflicts in the marketplace. I hear all the time the difference between a product team and a project team because they're both cross-functional. Let's start out with a project team first. So a project team, all right, think about a project it's like a story. It's got a beginning, middle, and an end, except it's pretty short. All right. So we may be doing a research project. We may launch a product. We may be doing an operational improvement. So our executives appoint people to the team. The team has to work collectively to get the work done. There's usually the watchful eye of a guide, like a product manager or a project manager. All right. So product managers also need to know project management, by the way. However, the team generally disbands when the work is done. A product team is different. A product team is a business leadership team. And one of the ways to visualize this is as a board of directors for a product. Now, you may not have an individual contributor product manager leading that large-scale business team, but it may depend on your company and the size and the industry that you're in. But think of board of directors. Now, when you think of that model, those are the people who are best equipped to work with one another and agree on the direction of a product's business and to delegate the resources to work on other product-related activities. And typically, they get the license to do this, number one, because they've earned the, the, the credibility, and number two, because they're accountable for some business results in the profit and loss. And then the third key point is that they are a strategically oriented team, even though may, they may direct tactical activities. Now, these distinctions, even looking at it on a PowerPoint, makes it seem easy, but when put into practice, may not be so easy. And this is the beast that lurks beneath the surface. And that's that big monster underneath, and the birds think they're, they're getting their breakfast, but they're getting a little bit more than they bargained for. What are they bargaining for? You know, even in very well-run firms, there are behavioral and cultural issues. 
And I will bet you, if you looked at this slide for a couple of minutes, you probably could say that there are bits and pieces of this, either in your current company or in your former companies, you will find this, this is amazing. Process confusion, misalignment, lack of communication, lack of trust, things like that. Well, we have some cures. There uh, is a guy named Patrick Lencioni. He wrote a book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And he also wrote some other books um, about this, even, I think, curing the five dysfunctions. Now, if you look at this pyramid and you look at the bottom of the period, it, pyramid, it says trust one another. Now, trust is an easy word to understand. It may be hard to implement. And we run our leadership workshops. One of the first questions we ask when we're doing the icebreaker is the people would go around the room and they introduce each other, and then we ask them to, to sit, tell a story about um, one aspect of their childhood that was particularly challenging and how they overcame that challenge. And when we kind of get ourselves back together again, uh, what, we, what we end up learning is that the people who are around the table may never have known that about one another. And when you've exposed that level of humanity to one another inside the corporate walls where we tend to leave our humanity outside, all of a sudden we have a different perspective on that human being. Now, when we have a better respect or a better picture of that human being, we're in a better position to engage with one another. And sometimes we have to engage in conflict. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to corral them and get everybody to make better commitments to some of the plans and the activities that they carry out so that it is easier to hold each other accountable and easier to achieve results. It doesn't mean that it's going to be a panacea and everything is going to be great. It just means we have a better chance of being successful. And there are some other contributors, commitment, buy-in, using metrics and performance guidelines that help shape what we do, and even in how we do things like attend meetings. I mean, we go to a lot of companies, and I'm sure you know this, everybody's sitting around the meeting table. It's 15 minutes late, and half the people aren't there. And they kind of dismiss it to each other. Well, it's important to attend meetings on time. And if you have something important that's coming online in three weeks and you know you're going to be late, don't tell the team a day before. Tell the team in enough time when they can do something with it. That's what's so important. Now, there are some mechanics. And what I'd like to talk about are these mechanics of cross-functional engagement. Now, if you look at the chart on the left, you can see across the top of the page there are different phases of a product's life cycle, and down the left side there are some different roles. And on the right side of the page, we have some interaction between people who play different roles. We use a technique called functional support planning. Function meaning a business function, support meaning you have to support one another, and planning is how we're going to get our work done. And so when people sit at a table and say, here's what I need from you during this program or to develop this product or to launch this product, and here's what you need from me, and here's when we need it, and here's what's going to happen if, we, if it doesn't happen. If we're in a better position to have this cross-organizational, cross-functional negotiation, we again have a better chance of achieving some, some success. So let's take a temperature test. So far, we've talked about product management and how it refers to the business management of products and, of course, the role of the product manager. We also talked a little bit about how product managers learn their work and to produce better outcomes and then ultimately how important a cross-functional product team is. You know something? We need to have a model. Product managers need business a business model, a relevant, usable business model. And that business model is the product management lifecycle model. And this is one portion of the model that I'm going to expose to you. There are four key areas of work within this model. Discovery and innovation, product planning, new product introduction, and post-launch product management. And if you can see underneath it, there are some different groupings. And they're, they're grouped because they're, and they're shaped a little bit differently. So the process of insight development and strategic planning is a little bit different than the boxes uh, of the depicted phase gate product development process, as well as a difference between the performance management process. But these are processes and sub-processes that are the supporting activities and practices that contribute toward better product management. And if you look at the top of the model, and there are arrows that go around the top and arrows that go around the, mo around the bottom, it's a recursive model. What this means is that, the, that uh, what, what, uh, what a product produces, the outcomes and results that are produced, are um, influencing the front end of, of the discovery and innovation process. So the model helps us to 
lay a foundation for continuous improvement. It also helps us to navigate work that we have to do. Okay, so here are the boxes underneath the areas of work that indicate the level of effort required to bring the model to life. And if we want to look at this collectively, this is what the product management life cycle brings. It brings a holistic model to manage products, services, and portfolios across their life cycle. And you can also get a copy of this, all right, because to explain this in the 39 sections would be a little bit difficult. So you can get a copy of the model um, at uh, sequentlearning.com slash model hyphen or pm hyphen model dot php. Um, you can also order a very large scale version of it, a 36 by 48 inch working model to corral your teams and bring them together. Now, W. Edwards Deming, a great teacher in how to improve product quality, did a great job. One of the things that Deming talked about all right, was a model for this continuous improvement. He came up with this plan, do, check, act model. It's, it's re in its simplicity, it is like poetry to business. We talk about planning or designing a path forward, doing work, which is em implementing and executing, checking our work, which is to evaluate and measure the performance, and act, make improvements. So the product management lifecycle model is a perfect representation for continuous improvement of products and portfolios. And when companies can commit to continuous improvement, they tend to encourage a higher degree of collaboration and communication, and everybody is moving in the same direction. That's what we want product managers to do, to be able to lead and synchronize and integrate. And while doing so, as we talk about in terms of um, cross-functional teams, is to improve communication by breaking down barriers. And one of the things that Deming, talk about, Deming talks about is you, people are internal clients to one another. So they treat each other differently, and therefore everybody becomes responsible for the product's business and continuous improvement. So it really is a wonderful model. How do we use the model? Let's look. Well, if we break down aspects of the model, like new product planning, right? Now, if you see underneath there, it says decision points, concepts, feasibility, and definition. Those are phases and those are gates. In a lot of the literature that we review and in a lot of companies that we work with, a lot of people put this model into practice. The, the product development model is always some kind of a name toward this toll gate or phase gate methodology. However, the way a lot of companies look at this is a work uh, expedition model, so to speak. I have to get my work done, and then I have to go check a box. Well, a box checking model is really not the best thing to do when you want to make decisions. You certainly want to make sure the work is getting done. But when we talk about concepts, hundreds of ideas, versus feasibility, fewer ideas, and we talk about definition, more focused work on the research and the documentation with a major decision point, that's why it's in red, as to whether or not we ought to make the investment. And that's what we're trying to do, is improve what's coming into the business so that we don't choke, if you will, downstream. Because ultimately, we have to get the work done. We have to develop our products, we have to launch the products. And as you see, development and launch are simultaneous activities. The way a lot of models present this is as they're, they're in a line, they're very, very linear, okay? And that the work that happens in an organization is really not so linear, right? People study it a lot and try to improve cycle time and things like that because the model is linear, but markets are really not very linear. They're very, very dynamic. And so um, we have to help people to understand that just because you're putting a product idea a product project through process, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, you, that each the way you use the process is going to be the same all the time. So we have to make sure that we can make the appropriate decisions, number one, and number two, that we use the process as intended. So for new products, use the process the way it needs to be because you need to do your homework. But if you have an enhancement you know, have a lot, and you have a lot of market information, a lot of financial data, and you really need to fine-tune what you're doing, you can compress phases and move faster. And that's what it's about, moving faster. And then ultimately, what we really want to do is manage a product like a business, which means that we're going to look at financial indicators and key performance indicators and other measures that allow us to analyze and, and, and evaluate and collect evidence so that we can make better decisions about what we ought to do next. So all 
product management processes ultimately can improve the business. So if we can abide by the idea that all products follow a life cycle, that if product managers and their team members know what they're supposed to do with whom and when, then what you're doing is building a higher level of business acumen across the entire organization. So we can't do this by ourselves. We really need people. We need our executives who are aligned, who can properly govern or guide product management as a business function. So let's do another survey. If you could influence your leadership in a way that would benefit product management, what would you like it to be? Would you like bosses to agree on the function and purpose of product management? Would you want an agreed upon set of processes to support product managers? Or do you want cl clearly communicated objectives from leadership to product managers? And if I look at the horse race, it looks like clearly communicated objectives is winning, followed by an agreed upon set of processes to support product managers. Hmm. Okay, let's, let's see what happens. And so it looks like clearly communicated objectives from leadership to product managers. Here's what we need. We need executives to be aligned around the function and purpose of product management. There probably isn't anything more important. You know, we always talk about in our corporate lives that change comes from the top. And when it comes to product management, nothing can be more important. And in a lot of firms, probably about 40 or 50 percent of the firms that we look at now, and, and, and this is a stark contrast even from 10 years ago, there is a chief product officer, okay, with a seat at the table, right? It's quite interesting. In, in the book Managing Product Management, David Payton from FedEx actually wrote, product management at FedEx has a seat at the executive table. That is wonderful. In well-run companies, a product portfolio council serves as a single source of reconciliation of all product, platform, and portfolio investments. You are, as, as, as individuals, we manage our own investment portfolio in our homes all right, and, and in our families. Once a year, we rebalance because the financial planners ask us to do that. And in companies, there is some general idea of how that ought to be evaluated. We always go through our budgeting and strategy processes every year. However, the actual work of a portfolio council requires an intense effort. All right? So that's another thing that we need. The fourth item is a governance board for product management. All right? um, not enough companies, maybe 20 or 30 percent of companies, have some kind of a governance structure. But only about half of those um, companies, so the executives tell us, um, feel that that governance board is doing as good a job as necessary. And there's a lot of turnover and churn in those. However, there has to be a group of executives, and sometimes not the senior executive leadership team, but a group of product management and possibly even other, some, some other cross-functional executives who set down the priorities for processes that are going to be used, for the data that's going to be managed, for the for the templates that are going to be utilized, or even for how teams are going to be structured. Right? And the thing that that governance board enables is continuous improvement of product management, which, as I asserted earlier, is vital to the success of the company and to the success of the product lines and the portfolios. So I would like to conclude with a couple of key points as to why product managers ma management matters, and then we'll go to some Q&A. Number one. Product management is a function. And then when, when executives charter it appropriately, embedded into the genetics of the firm, it will add more value than any other function because it focuses on a product business from a holistic function, uh, perspective. There really isn't any other function in the business that is capable of doing that level of effort. The second point, and this is probably the most important point as to why product management matters to your firm, is that product management is transformative. It can transform an organization into an incredibly highly performing market-focused enterprise, not a reactive enter enterprise, not a tactical enterprise, but a competitive company. All right? And that means that we can look at new markets to conquer, new products to develop, new innovations to bring to market. And when we're focusing on market, what we're doing is we're minimizing functional agendas who may not act on the best behalf of the company. This is why product management matters. And I thank you so much for listening with me today. And right now, I'd like to open up to some Q&A. Great. So thank I you.
Perfect. So I, I would like to remind our audience, if you would like to ask a question, go ahead and type in that Q&A box in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. We do have a few questions that are coming through for you, Stephen. Our first question, can you please provide us with some well-known examples of companies who do product management well? Yeah, we can. And, and some of them were actually cited in the book Managing Product Management. Companies like TD Bank, FedEx, Thomas & Betts, now owned by ABB. Well-run companies um, are doing a really great job of that. And those people have actually written case studies about that. Can I, can I actually, um, there's actually a, a question in here that I'm looking at. It says, if a firm is doing a poor job of product management, how do you suggest embarking on the massive change process? That is huge. And, and I have to say, um, it's a very simple answer, um, baby steps, um, except it's, it's like strategy. And you can't go make a change unless you really understand what you need to do. And so it's, when you're doing a strategy for a product or a business, you have to figure out the path you've traveled, where you are now, and what are the kinds of things you want to do. And from that, there's, there are, are, are things that you can do. And so there's a diagnostic procedure that you can go through to evaluate the firm's overall maturity and the ability to embed or enable product manager, as well as evaluating the competencies and capabilities of the people who are actually in role. And when you get the lay of the land and you understand the reference model for best-in-class product management, you can start to lay a path forward in small steps. Okay? Let's see what else. Um, how different is product management in managing an in-house product compared to that of an OEM product? You know, a lot of companies um, uh, have internal products to one another. Banks and brokerages um, have products that are used internally to support one another. And, and actually, it's really quite interesting. I did some work with a, an electric utility company where um, it was really interesting. The IT department was wondering why were they were losing market share to external competitors in things like computers and smartphones. And they weren't following good product management practices and protocols. And so when that utility firm actually implemented product management practices they, and they became customers to one another, they, they were a much more performing and efficient enterprise. So that was great. Uh, let's see. It says, in some firms, innovation and product lifecycle management is separate. Is that something you have seen in your career? Um, in, in, many, in many cases, they are, they are separate. Um, I did some interviewing for, um, for the book Managing Product Management, and, and I also actually, it's interesting, I wrote an, uh, a chapter in the upcoming PDMA Handbook for New Product Development. And in one of the interviews I had with an R&D head, and actually I was validating this point, what, what the what several executives had actually said is, there are people who are in product management who are freed up to do some other discovery activities, and that the ideas and the opportunities that they come, they come up with are not subject to the highest degree of scrutiny or governance that other product projects are. And so what ends up happening in, that com in, that, in those companies is that they, they carry two separate streams. However, in other companies where the innovation process is treated the same way the product development process is treated, then they go through the same vetting process, and you're really not coming up with any innovations. You're actually coming up with some, some functional survival issues. That's, that's quite interesting. So let's see what we have here. Um, are your books available as an e-book? Yes, they are available for Kindle Reader. Um, let's see. Uh, what are the known obstacles of moving toward the ideal organization with a chief product officer and a product portfolio council? Uh, th that's a really, really wonderful question. Uh, first of all, um, you know, it's almost like therapy. <laughs> Executives need to understand that there's an issue. And in some companies, uh, sometimes they want to pay attention and some kind, sometimes they don't. And I can tell you there's some very well-run companies, well-known companies that we work with, very large um, companies that have done product management really well, and then they went through some changes. So there was one very, very substantial company that um, we actually benchmarked many years ago, and they changed, and their executive leadership team changed, um, and they became a very, very deal-driven or sales-driven culture over a, a period of about 10 years. And all of a sudden, in the last year or two, they're realizing, wait a minute, we've lost our way. And so that executive team has come to that realization. And, um, you know, sometimes it's actually like talking to your kids. You know, you can tell your kids one thing, but sometimes they just have to experience it themselves. So um, that's another one. Let's see what we got here. Whoops. Uh-oh. Uh, sorry about that. I'm trying to scan these questions over here. 
why did you decide to get into product management? What a wonderful question. Um, it, uh, it was by accident. <laughs> very, very interesting. Um, and it's funny, I was actually talking to the person who um, said I wanted to be a product manager. I was a, I'm a finance guy, and um, one of the roles I had in a former company was as a financial analyst. And I used to figure out how things were happening inside of a company. And I was uh, slated for a promotion, and my boss's boss asked me, this is back a number of years ago, and she asked me, so what do you want to do for a living? And I said, well, I'd like to be a general manager of a company. And after some conversation, she said to me, oh, you want to be a product manager? And I said, no, I really don't want to do that job. And she says, oh, yes, you do. And so I ended up taking a one-week course inside of AT&T. And this, again, this was a very long time ago. And I fell in love with, with the profession because it was such a challenge. It was like running a business. And the other thing that I love about product management, as well as the current job I have, which is being a product manager, really, is my day is different all the time. I, I, I'm not a kind of a person who likes um, rote tasks and things like that, so I could never be a dentist or pump gas or anything like that. So I'm very well suited to being a product manager. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, this is a long question. Uh, our executives bought into and launched product management two years ago in our organization, but have fallen back on the old habits, letting sales or technology mm -hmm, or any other function make decisions that should be owned by PM. While they profess that PM owns the function and decision-making process, they turn their back on violations. How do you enforce PM contract with executives that believe they've enabled the PM group? All right, so, so that, it's almost like we need some therapy. Um, in, in, in our past, in working with uh, senior leadership teams, um, the thing that we have seen is that when a CEO takes a stand on what product management represents, it tends to be more durable. When other business leaders from other functions assert that their function is more important, like sales, like, well, you would be, no you, you would be nowhere if, if, it, if it weren't for my sales, or you would be nowhere without my technologies, all right? All of a sudden, it's almost like the CEO and that's not a situation that we would necessarily want. And so um, it really is up to executive uh, leadership. Okay? Let's see. Uh, right, I'm going to scroll down here. Do you see a big difference between products and services? That's a great question. Um, let's see. Uh, a, a, the way we describe product, a product is something you sell. It has value to somebody. The product can be tangible or the product can be intangible. So in that respect, there is really no difference between a product and a service other than the fact that there's a tangible and intangible nature, and I'll tell you why. If, if you look at the product management lifecycle model and you look at discovery and innovation, and you look at, let's say, the market insight development process, would you think that there is a difference in how customer research is carried out for a tangible product versus an intangible product, or how competitive profiling is done, or how the strategic planning process works for a product or a product line, or even how the product development decision-making process looks? And the answer is there isn't a difference. Perhaps the domains are a little bit different. Perhaps downstream having a, a supply chain and manufacturing and those different functions will, will, will be different, of course. But those are only differences, so we don't pay attention to manufacturing when we're in a, an intangible business, okay? But cross-functional teams, performance management, launching a product into market properly, those are the same. Okay, so that's a really, really great question. The questions are flying in at 400 miles an hour. Uh, let's see what we got here. How should the relationship between product managers are in in an R&D environment than product managers on the customer side. Um, if, if a company has actually gone to the point of actually distinguishing that there are two different kind of product managers, they've already succumbed to um, siloism. Uh, product managers are business managers. So um, working in a technical company may be different, but a product manager should be a business manager of products, and product management may require some slight distinctions. However, if we adhere to the business management of products, then it may not belong in that environment. Let's see what else. What kind of personal traits do product managers usually have, and what makes you a good product manager? That's, that's really quite interesting. Um, 
in, in the upcoming survival guide, I'm actually writing a 40-some-odd question evaluative tool for, for, for people. And it really is a very, very broad set of traits that can run from inquisitive, inquisitiveness to, and curiosity to how we think in a critical way to how we interpret processes to the way we relate to other people to how we present, right? You can look at all the interpersonal skills. So if we look at some of the things I talked about a couple of minutes ago with respect to, um, uh, you know, what, what is a good characteristic for a, a product management person or a product management in an organization, um, it's about the business management of product. It's about strong cross-functional team building and the good politicking and networking that it goes, it goes with that. It's that business acumen. It's getting stuff in the complex, getting stuff done in the complex organization. Those are the kinds of things that, uh, that we're looking for. Okay. Let's get a couple or more uh, questions, and then we'll sign off. What is the most effective way to pull down silos? That's a really, really great question. So we can, we can approach this from two different perspectives. One could be the top-down, and the other one could be the bottom-up. So let's do bottom-up first. Um, build constituencies, work with one another co more collectively, um, uh, build strong relationships with other people, build trust with one another. Uh, help, and I have an expression, it's called help until it hurts. Um, that uh, you're the person who is always going out of your way to help other people as opposed to other people helping you. Because there was, a, there was a, a person who once wrote something about, you know, making deposits in an emotional bank account and that um, if, if you help others more and support more, then you'll ultimately get more. But when you have to ask for more, then you'll, your withdrawal is greater than all the deposits that you may have put in. So at the, at the interpersonal level, that's where we build our relationships. However, from the top down, we need better alignment at the senior executive level. So when all the executives agree and commit to what product management is about, and they all agree on how resources and investments are going to be allocated down to the product teams, then we're in a better position to know what we're supposed to do. And as you saw in, in the survey or the poll that we did during the, the a couple of slides back, that we want clarity about what the objectives are going to be before we, we carry on this work. So that kind of clarity would be very important. And let's see. Um, let's do one more. What kinds of tools and measures are available to assess the abilities of product managers? Uh, um, we have one. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a competency assessment. Um, and not to say competent slash incompetent. What it is is it's a, it's a tool that allows us to evaluate experience of what people are or have done in their past. And some of them may be product management experience and some could be experience in other areas. However, you, it's the collective you or the collective product person that we're evaluating in terms of the current state of experience. And then that, from that, we, there are gap analyses that we can perform that allow us to look at what, what are the, what are the uh, best in class reference mo points that we need to work toward, and then we can fill in those gaps with the work activities and the experience and things like that overall. Okay? And the questions keep coming in, so I'm going to do, I'll, I promise I'll just do one more here. Um, let's see. Um, actually, somebody asked about um, our company. We offer a lot of training, but how do clients supplement the training to increase chances that PMs weave what they've learned into their everyday work? Um, well, um, training is, is only a means to an end. Um, part of the solution is in understanding where people actually are and then figuring out what the remedial work has to be. And, and what we will do very often is provide guidance to executives and managers in terms of how they can create experiential programs and other activities to change the behavior and performance of product managers so that they can up their game. And so a lot of what we do is to enable and help um, managers so they can be more independent and so that they can help their product managers. Okay. And so let's see what else. Um, I think, let's see, that is probably about it. All right, so how about if we wrap up? And what I'm going to ask uh, you to do, if you don't mind, is to take a quick survey, all right? And um, if you can put your name and your email address and your phone in there, it would be really great. Um, but in terms of using the, the survey, in terms of relevance and whatever,
whether or not I met your expectations, uh, and if you'd like to have a chat with us, um, things like that. So if you please take a, a couple of minutes to fill the survey out, and I thank you so very much for spending the afternoon with me, and I look forward to, you, to seeing you about once a month uh, as we deliver more of these webinars over the next several years. And thank you very much. Thank you all very much. This does conclude today's webinar. You may now disconnect. Have a wonderful afternoon.